Hi, I'm Roger Bolton. I'm the president of PAGE, and I'm grateful to Global Alliance for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about the PAGE research report called the CCO as Pace Setter. We began this journey in 2007, which was the year that the iPhone was introduced. And the social media revolution, which we now experience, had only just begun. However, the internet had been in place for some years, and it was already clear that the world was changing in profound ways. One of which was that an enterprise wishing to be trusted by stakeholders truly had to authentically be what it aspires to be in all of its actions hence the report, The Authentic Enterprise. It took us several years to really think through how the role of the CCO was changing, and the Building Belief Report, which set out the PAGE model, is, uh, was then our hypothesis, which has since been confirmed, that the role is changing profoundly. We dug even more deeply into that with the new CCO report in 2016, and then our new report, The CCO is Paysetter, was produced, and that's the report that we'll be talking about today. The Pacesetter Report was our most thoroughly researched report ever. Over 18 months, we traveled to 15 countries and interviewed more than 200 communication leaders. After we completed our qualitative research, we verified our hypothesis with a quantitative survey, which was distributed worldwide through our global partners, and we're grateful to APCO Worldwide for their work in helping us to uh, field this survey. We always begin every research effort by looking at the business environment in which our companies are operating. And it was striking as we went around the world and talked to those 200 communicators that every single company was experiencing disruption. Many of them due to the rise of new business models, all of them by technology, but also by new voices calling on businesses to create more than just shareholder value, to create multi-stakeholder value and societal value, Interestingly enough, emerging new at that time, but since confirmed from investors, of course, the data revolution enabling deep personalization of our interaction with stakeholders, but also the weaponization of information. Uh, and our ultimate conclusion was that the CEO needs help in helping the enterprise respond to disruption by transforming itself into a new kind of enterprise. Of course, we're very cognizant of the fact that in the 18 months since the Paysetter report was concluded, the business environment has continued to change rapidly due to the pandemic, the racial crisis. Uh, we've seen accelerating digital transformation in all enterprises worldwide, even more, more highly ramped up expectations for stakeholder capitalism, hyperpolarization and an assault on truth, and the newest factor is new kinds of new ways of working and significant mental health concerns. So now let's get to the report itself. The CCO's pace set of report lays out four dimensions which represent the areas that we think chief communication officers need to be focused on in their efforts to help the CEO transform their enterprises. Those are societal value, corporate brand, corporate culture, and ComTech. And in order to uh, understand those, you really have to be grounded in the PAGE model. So let's just take a quick second to go through the PAGE model, and then we'll talk about how each of these new four dimensions relate to that. You can see here that the PAGE model has two parts. The first is corporate character, and the second is authentic advocacy. Let's start with corporate character. So corporate character refers to the enterprise's unique differentiating identity. In other words, what it really is, what it really stands for is determined by its stated mission, purpose, and values, and is played out in its culture, its business model, strategy, brand, policies, and positions. Now, 
you might argue that this is not the role of the chief communication officer to determine all of these elements. And of course, you'd be right. But what we're saying is that the CCO, who should work as a true partner with the CEO and across the enterprise to make sure that the enterprise actually thinks through all of these elements, defines them and aligns them, and then carries them out in such a way that the enterprise truly is true to itself and authentic, to use the word we chose for the authentic enterprise. In fact, Arthur W. Page, who was a real person, he was the head of corporate communication for AT&T from 1927 to 1946, famously said, public relations is 90% doing and 10% talking about it. In other words, if you truly wish to be trusted, it's what you do every day in the world that matters most. The second part of the model, authentic advocacy, refers to the work of earning trust of stakeholders. How does one do that? And we argue that it begins by building shared belief between your own corporate character, who you truly are, and the beliefs of the stakeholders who have an interest in your organization. Sometimes they may be aligned, sometimes they may be opponents, but the key is to find where is the area of shared belief and then to build a dialogue around that to build on that shared belief to the point that an action occurs. It could be buying the product or buying the stock or supporting a policy objective or possibly even stopping a criticism. That would be a welcome action sometimes. Over time, if it's not just a one-off, but there is an actual relationship developed, you instill confidence with ongoing behavior that's aligned with your corporate character, which can turn a stakeholder who might initially have been an opponent into an advocate. And then the circle begins again. The obvious desired outcomes are the actions. The advocacy results in more shared belief and more actions by others, and the circle continues. Okay, so that's the page model. Now, let's return to the pace setter report. Three of the four dimensions of the pace setter report that I mentioned just a minute ago relate to corporate character, societal value, corporate brand, and corporate culture. Now, each one of these are things that kind of relate to the mission, the purpose, and the values of the company. And there is an opportunity, clearly, for the chief communication officer to work with the CEO and across the enterprise on these definitional things, mission, purpose, and values, which then gives you an entree or permission to begin to get into the discussion of societal value, corporate brand, and corporate culture in a way that takes you even further into the operations of the company. Thinking about that 90% of Mr. Page, is 90% what you do. So these are opportunities to get yourself into the discussion around what the company actually does in these areas. Okay, so let's start with societal value. We argue that there are three ways that an enterprise can create value for society, broad societal value. The first is through core products and services, the things you make and sell. How do they make the world better? And what kind of case can you make for the value that this has for society? The second is ESG and sustainability policies. So in the course of making and selling the stuff that you make and sell, you have impacts on the world, some of which are positive, communities, benefits, employment, et cetera, and others may be negative, environmental impacts, climate, et cetera. And the third is by companies actually taking stands on societal issues, which is increasingly uh, requested actually by employees and others in society, that business takes stands on societal issues, CEO activism, if you will. So here's an example of a company that's focused on creating societal value through its core business products and services. CEO Franz von Houten uh, made a decision a number of years ago that he really wanted to focus on health. And he actually spun off uh, some of the businesses that were not related to that 
and doubled down on healthcare related products and services and has, working with the uh, CCO at Walsh has made a specific stand to try to improve the lives of people around the world uh, through better health. So I was the CCO at Aetna some years ago when uh, the company was struggling, frankly, and the board uh, got rid of the CEO and hired a new one, Jack Rowe, who is a medical doctor, not just any medical doctor. He was the CEO of Mount Sinai, which is one of the great academic medical centers in the world. But Jack came in and said, we've got it all wrong. We're fighting with the doctors. We're making enemies of patients because we're spending all our time trying to hold down costs, when in actuality, we ought to be working with doctors, giving them the information they need to make better decisions that will help people achieve health care, and in the process, uh, will meet our financial objectives as well. So I worked with Jack and with Ron Williams, who he brought in as the chief operating officer, to kind of redefine the company, who we are and uh, created a whole new set of products and services designed to provide doctors and patients with the information they need to make better choices that will help people achieve health and financial security and protect their uh, uh, financials against risk. So moving on to ESG or sustainability policies and back to Philips because Franz von Houten, in addition to focusing on improving people's health through core products and services, also has made an environmental commitment to take back all of the major large health equipment that they sell at the end of its useful life cycle and to uh, reuse as much of it as possible in the circular economy, which is making a significant contribution to the environment. Another ESG example, General Motors, Mary Barra, the CEO. GM's major contribution through its core products and services is mobility. But as she says, that's somewhat taken for granted. So when talking about societal value, she's really focused on her major commitment to zero, zero, zero. Zero crashes, zero emissions, zero congestion. Those three things are all bad side effects, if you will, of the wonderful benefit of mobility. And she's determined to uh, address all of those and, in fact, has indicated that GM will sell only electric cars beginning in 2035. Okay, on to public stands for societal issues. Here's an example of a company, Godridge, which took a strong stand in favor of LGBTQ rights for their own employees at a time when India was opposing a UN resolution banning the death penalty for consensual same-sex relations and prior to the 2018 ruling by the Supreme Court in India, which decriminalized same-sex relations. Back to my friend Jack. Uh, he became CEO at a time when insurance companies were not paying for genetic testing, which could help detect a propensity to disease. And individuals were afraid to let the insurance companies find out that they might have a propensity to genetic disease. And Jack uh, changed Aetna's policies and campaigned for federal law, which made it a requirement for insurance companies to pay for genetic testing and to uh, not discriminate as a result of any findings that they made. So for each of these four dimensions, we've created progression paths, which give our members an opportunity to kind of learn how you progress from a professional level to a pace setter level in terms of your ability to impact your organization in each of these four areas. For each one, we begin with the basics. In the case of societal value, you start by defining the corporate commitment to what value do you create with your core products and services? What are your ESG policies? Are you going to do social activism? And then shaping a story around that so that stakeholders begin, can begin to understand your commitment to societal value. As you progress, you get an opportunity to work with the CEO and across the business to ensure that the business is in fact committed to the policies that you've set in your definitional work. In other words, you've got to actually do it. You can't just talk about it. You've got to put those things in place and the CEO has an opportunity to work with the CEO and across the business to make the promise real.
And finally, at the pace setter level, you're working to make societal value creation part of the fabric of how you run your business. Specifically, it's embedded in your annual strategy process. It's oriented toward delivering accountability around results and engaging stakeholders at all levels around the societal value creation proposition that you've created for your business. The second major pillar is corporate brand. And when we talk about corporate brand, we're referring to the experience that all stakeholders have with the enterprise, everything that they see, hear, and experience through every touch point that they have with the enterprise. So you may think of branding as something that's owned by the chief marketing officer, and frankly, we did too. But as we went through our interviews for this research, we found consistently that many of our CCO colleagues were indicating ownership of corporate brand. And these are just a few of the companies we talked to who said that. And when we did our quantitative research later, we were able to verify that 60% of chief communication officers now have formal responsibility for corporate brand. So just as in the case with societal value, when you have ownership of corporate brand, it gives you significant leverage and responsibility for defining the company's actions and actually helping to influence them at all levels throughout the company. Of course, it begins with defining the brand, what the company intends to stand for, and frankly, that work can be dovetailed directly with the societal value work if you wanna make corporate purpose a central piece of the corporate brand identity. So you define the narrative and you begin to create the visual standards around that and to begin to tell the story. But that's just the beginning. The next step, as it was in societal value, is to get the business actually committed to delivering on the brand promise. So you've got to uh, develop brand attributes that are decision-making criteria for the business as it begins to implement its strategy and its business model. And that then takes you into defining the multi-stakeholder experience and defining the key touch points that determine that experience and working with the business to make delivering on those key touch points a central part of the way that they operate. So I hope by now you're beginning to see how the CCO has an opportunity through societal value and brand and now culture to have an impact on the way the organization actually conducts business and acts in day-to-day -day life. Corporate culture is an area where the CCO typically has a fair amount of involvement at a minimum in communicating the, the values and the desired culture that one's trying to create but there's also often an opportunity to help work with the CHRO and across the enterprise to define that culture and to become involved in aligning it with the brand and the societal value proposition. General Motors CEO, Mary Barra again, of course, culture is not just a set of values that you put up on the wall, but it actually is how you act. It's the way we do things around here. So the values have to be translated into behaviors and the entire enterprise has to come to understand what those behaviors are. As we did in societal value and in corporate brand, here in corporate culture, again, we have a progression path which shows one how one begins and then gets more sophisticated and then builds, builds it into the pattern of the business. As in the other two cases, it begins with definition. In this case, with regard to culture, it's the from to, from, what, from the current culture to the new desired culture, and what are the changes that we're required to make in behaviors in order to achieve that new culture. Then you begin to develop a plan and work to develop awareness around the business of the need for this culture change. As you get more sophisticated, you begin to drive culture change. You're doing gap analysis, you're building leadership capability, establishing management incentives through the performance management system, identifying roadblocks. And then eventually when you get to the pace setter level, the culture change has become systemic. 
it's been incorporated into strategic planning, addressing your policies and practices, and you've got measurement designed to report and continuously improve as you begin to refine and make the culture a part of the way you think about running your business. And now we come to the fourth dimension, ComTech. This one is related to the stakeholder engagement piece of the PAGE model. And the term ComTech is actually borrowed from marketing where a very sophisticated set of tools has been developed in recent years and a whole vernacular around that called MarTech, which is designed to reach customers at the individual level. And we began to ask ourselves, well, where's ComTech? Can't we use these kinds of sophisticated tools to understand the multi-stakeholder environment down to the individual level and to have impact in the way that we develop and build relationships with stakeholders through the multi-stakeholder environment? So again, as in the other areas, we've established a progression path to help us understand how one becomes more sophisticated at engaging in this thing we call ComTech. At the beginning level, ComTech looks like the things that many of us have been doing in recent years, developing content tailored to specific social media channels, monitoring social platforms for keywords and sentiment, determining audiences by platform, and in general, getting used to using social media as a way to engage with stakeholders. But as we get more sophisticated in our use of ComTech, we have to understand that the real key here is designing journeys that help people along the way to decision-making and actions. Now, we have to be very careful here to make sure that we do this with integrity and ethics we're not trying to manipulate people into taking actions they otherwise would not want to, but rather to use the page model way of thinking about it to develop shared belief, to encourage people to take actions when those are mutually beneficial over time, confidence is developed in the uh, relationship, and the stakeholders can become advocates to others to help them down similar journeys to decision making and action. So here's a chart borrowed from MarTech that gives one a sense of how one designs a journey, in this case, to purchase. It begins with awareness and then developing interest and consideration, purchase, and then retention, so that's multiple purchases, confidence is developed, and then advocacy, very similar to the page model for multi-stakeholders. At each point along the way, each of these dots represents a touch point where content is experienced that's developed by the company and you, in this interactive social media environment, help to move people down the funnel, if you will, the marketing funnel to decision, action, and ultimately to advocacy. We can do the same thing for multi-stakeholders on different kinds of decisions, whether it's to support a policy or to uh, endorse the company in some way, it's, it's, an, it's a journey. And all of this, of course, requires completely new ways of thinking and acting for corporate communication leaders. You have to build the technology stack. Uh, what are the technologies that allow you to do this? Agile teams that are constantly iterating and learning what works and what doesn't for different types of stakeholders, developing trusted content, and again, learning in the interaction with stakeholders what they really need to hear what kind of content they want and using very sophisticated analytics at every step along the way so that you're constantly adjusting as you learn. So that's it. That's the summary of the Paysetter Report. I hope you can see and agree, in fact, that there is a huge opportunity for CCOs and their teams to work with the CEO and across the C-suite to provide great value as businesses seek to transform in the face of existential disruption. This requires new skills, a new mindset, new approaches, and uh, Paige is actually working on CCO guides, which will be available in each of these four areas. And we are just introducing the Page Learning Lab, which is a new opportunity to take courses that will help one get even more sophisticated at understanding how to engage in all of these uh, levels of activity.
The Learning Lab will have specific courses developed uh, by PAGE on the PAGE Thinking and also curated content from other sources as well, a peer community where you can interact with people, and exclusive webinars where one can learn more detailed information about these various progression paths. Content streams have been developed for each area of the Pace Setter Report and a number of other areas as well, and you'll be able to design your own journey down the path to learning in each of these areas. The access to the Page Learning Lab will be on an annual subscription basis for individuals or teams, and we hope to make it available to non-members in uh, the middle of this year. Thanks again to Global Alliance for the opportunity to speak with you today. I hope that uh, this was helpful, and if you have any specific comments and would like to reach out to me, I'd be delighted to hear from you. My email is rbolton at page.org. Thank you.